of agricultural equipment, as well as to get a 20% concession on the purchase of a farm vehicle. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have even got a couple, three weeks ago, I went back out there and I was given pumpkin, yam, banana, and planting from these same farmers who bulldozed down their land and started their cultivation. Mr. Speaker, in the parish of St. Mary, 82 farmers who are members of a farming organization are now occupying 300 acres of land. The National Land Agency is presently arranging to have this property leased to the organization. In the parish of Westmoreland, sorry here that the member from Eastern is not here, a large investor has cleared 170 acres and planted a variety of crops, including ice potato, onion, papa, pineapple, banana, etc. Twelve small farmers from the area were assigned 20 acres on the property to cultivate free of cost. This is the farmer's way of giving back to the community. The lease for this property is being prepared by the National Land Agency and is well advanced. But you know, Mr. Speaker, this land has been lying there for years. And it so happened that this investor came to the property with myself and the member of parliament, and I'm sorry he's not here, from Eastern Westmoreland. And the member of parliament said that he has been trying to get the land leased and could not get it leased. And I said to the member of parliament, see the investor here, I am now telling him that he said that he had applied to National Land Agency and he has been waiting for six months and can't get nothing from the land agency. I said, get going. We need Irish potato to plant right away. You are an importer of Irish potato. Clear the land, plant Irish potato. That after, after talking to the National Land Agency, talking to RADA and saying to them, is it all right for him to go through? There is a process which we went through. Wait, no. No, no, no. I am saying, I am saying to you, no, I am saying to you, no, 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 no. Listen, I said that there is a process. Don't take it out of context. Go, and I said, and it, the rather person advised that he said that he can go on the land. The rather person advised. The manager said that he must go on the land. I can't do it because it's not my land. I said, through, after he had got, after, all right. Yes. All right. What happened is that what we are looking at now is that the process of approval is one whereby we get NLA, we get RADA to approve the land, and with that, they then go on the land and they get to go. Right, sir? But what happened, let me just explain. What, yes, I'm clarifying, but what I it was getting at is that the member of parliament who was there could not get the land under production. So I said at that time, see here, Mr. MP, the land is now going to be under production during our government time. Mr. Speaker, these large acres of Ireland own lands in St. Anne, St. Mary, Portland, and Manchester are in the process of being leased to small farmers and farmers' organizations. Mr. Speaker, this speaks volumes as to the potential development of agriculture under this government. However, we are not satisfied with potential. We are, we are about action, not about a mouth. We are making sure that these productive lands are put into agricultural production 
before the concrete mixers come. Because we understand that there are much of this land, it is being looked at to be taken to build houses. And we feel that these good lands in these areas should be put into agricultural production. Mr. Speaker, Minister Shaw recently announced that there will soon be roughly 10,400 acres available for crop and livestock production between the parishes of Clarendon and St. Catherine. These lands will be made available to both large investors and small farmers. The Small Ruminants Association has already indicated an interest in acquiring a portion of these lands to establish a modern goat rearing facility. Mr. Speaker, at present there is a glut of some agricultural produce in various parts of the island, while other parts are experiencing a scarcity. Skellion is an example where in South St. Elizabeth and South Manchester is being sold for a maximum of $40 per pound. Whereas in less than that, whereas in Portland and St. Mary, the going price for the same product is over $100 per pound in some areas. The lack of a structured distribution network for local agricultural production is the problem. We have started our farmer's market with the kickoff last Friday at the Ministry's Hope Complex. What? This is, yes. Yes, and this was, this was started by, by the minister from West Central St. Catherine from those times. This is to take, and then continued by the, the minister at that time from Western St. Mary, continued. This is to take off some of the excess produce our farmers now have on hand. Mr. Speaker, this issue brings into focus the importance of an agroeconomic zone where all the produce grown by the farmer is marketed at the complex. The farmer enjoys a ready market at a contracted price. This agroeconomic zone may be a public-private enterprise as now exists in Hounslow, St. Elizabeth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the member's time be extended for 15 minutes to enable him to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Those against? Eyes of it. Minister Thank you very Johnson. much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. Especially the agroeconomic zone where all the produce grown, the farmer enjoys a ready market at a contracted price. This agroeconomic zone may be a public-private enterprise that now exists in Hounslow. This is where Grace has their enterprise going. Mr. Speaker, we have to increase production of the various crops in order for the facilities in the complex to be provided with adequate throughput to make its operation efficient. Mr. Speaker, agroeconomic zones will be located at strategic areas throughout the island, providing easy access for the farmer to market their produce. I'll be putting forward a proposal for a government entity to construct structures on some of these government lands to be leased to companies for the establishment of the agroeconomic zone where they have grading, packaging, processing, cold storage, drying facility with a retail outlet. Mr. Speaker, properties that come to mind are Culloden in Westmoreland, Hague in Trelawney, licensed in St. Thomas, 
Gibraltar in St. Mary, and the AMC complex in Kingston. Private companies would construct and operate at Holland in St. Lisbeth, Montpellier in Hanover, and Spring Plains in Clarendon. Mr. Speaker, we have the Jamaica Stock Exchange, and we also have the Junior Stock Exchange. Right, my minister? Mr. Speaker, I am proposing, I am proposing to have a Jamaica Agro Exchange. This will work in tandem with the existing Jamaica Stock Exchange, with its brokers, client accounts, trading e engine, and governance processes. Coupled with this, the widespread dissemination of agricultural products, information, transparent pricing, and recruited buyers, the existing components create advantages for farmers and buyers in Jamaica and other regional markets. Mr. Speaker, the Jamaica Agro Exchange system can address many of the largest issues being faced in the agricultural sector, thereby bringing value to its stakeholders immediately. Specifically, it will increase payments to farmers in a much more timely manner, reduces the incidence of predilasne, increases quantity and volumes, and enhances marketing activities for farmers drastically. On each trading day, sellers of agricultural products deliver products to the agroeconomic zone, speci specifying their desired price to their broker's representative. The exchange via wireless technology will upload orders to their back office system as done today. Buyers will, in turn, through their brokers, place funds on account as they enter orders. At the close of each trading day, the buyers take possession of the products purchased and their funds are credited to the account of the corresponding sellers with next day settlement. It is proposed to have at least six locations where the wireless technology will overlay with existing systems and communicate to the centralized services. Yes. As an industry facility, the Jamaica Agricultural Exchange will bring transparency, productivity, and local value added to the agricultural industry at all its locations. It will boost employment in the rural areas almost immediately with minimal training. A public-private partnership structured will deliver the project with a pilot phase operational within six months. Mr. Speaker, this is another example of how we intend to maximize the use of cutting-edge technology to drive prosperity through agriculture. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Hidalasin is one of the main deterrents of persons wishing to enter the agricultural sector. The main subsection, the main subsector preying upon my, by thieves is that of small ruminants, goat and sheep. Farmers complain that when a predial thief is caught and he goes to court, the fine level is minuscule compared to the cost of goods stolen. This may even encourage the thief to enrich himself in this way. We are therefore examining the Agricultural Produce Act to propose that restitution is given to the victim of the offense so that the thief pays an amount equal to the value of the agricultural commodity stolen if it cannot be returned. Interest should also be paid if any is incurred by delays. This is in addition to his sentence line. Mr. Speaker, in closing, 
I want to thank God for his many blessings on us as a nation, especially on this administration led by, led by the Honorable Andrew Holness, which has been given the horrendous task of empowering our people with love, peace, happiness, and prosperity. And we are, and, and, and we are 64% of the people have said that they are better off today than two years ago. We are, we are a go we are, we, we are a government, we are a government embracing, we are a government embracing a philosophy of together we can. Adhering to the principle of dignity and respect for others. Empowering those technology savvy conceptualizers with zeal and tenacity for upward mobility. Committing to a vision for encapsulating a market for all visionary entrepreneurs. Uplifting them myopic and degraded for the fulfillment of inner self-esteem. Enhancing a cadre of youth and women to forge the foray onto the land of our holistic and sustainable development of our bedrock. Mr. Speaker, faith and prayer are both invisible, but, but they make the impossible possible. This, this administration is making things possible and will continue to make more things possible because if music be the food of love, we are going to play on. So strength, so strength grows when we dare. Unity grows when we peer. Love grows when we care and relation grows when we share. Let us not be quacking like ducks in a mire of frustration, but soaring like eagles above our trials, above our, our trials and tribulation. God bless us all as a nation. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Well done, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we will now we will now have presentation from the member from Northwest. Manchester. Northwest Manchester, who I know has been anxious to make his presentation. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to make my contribution to the debate on the state of the economy's transport sector, land, sea, and air, as well as contribution, the condition of our road infrastructure and network. As I have said before, the development of this sector is integral to the country's ability to experience sustainable growth and therefore, it remains an imperative that the current administration invest wisely in the various modalities which would drive the overall development of the transport sector. 
We can't expect to bring our goods and services to market if we do not have proper road infrastructure and a network favorable to industries and to the movement of ordinary people. We simply can't demand or expect to see an increase in productivity and at the same time be derelict in our responsibility to provide the people with the means to bring the fruits of their effort to the marketplace and to provide for the efficient movement of people to work, school, and leisure. Mr. Speaker, at the outset, I want to express my appreciation to and support for the Leader of the Opposition for his continued confidence in me to shadow the portfolio of transport and works. All of you here know, the, know of the history between myself and the Leader of the Opposition. And therefore, it should, be not, it should not be a surprise to anyone if I pronounce that the Leader has my full support and I continue to appreciate his guidance and counsel in things that I do. I also want, I also want to thank my colleagues, my colleague Richard, Richard Azan, the member from Clarendon Northwest, who shares the works portfolio with me for his continuous support, knowledge, and insight. Later on, Mr. Speaker, I will speak up some remarks, speak on some remarks, speak will make some remarks on some issues of concern in the portfolio. Members and will speak further and will, and will present a fulsome analysis of the works portfolio. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to state for the record my continued presence in this House is only made possible by the constituents of Northwest Manchester, who by their votes have expressed continued confidence in my ability to represent their interest here. I will certainly do everything possible to make them proud of my representation on their behalf in this honorable house. Mr. Speaker, I would like to also the presence of my better half, Shelley. My, my two daughters, Mr. Speaker, who continues to be present. My four councillors, councillors Facey, Sampson, Collins, and Kennedy. Members of my executive, Members from Region 5 present here. Mr. Ke Kevon Knight, Youth Parliamentarian for Northwest Manchester. We also have present here students and teachers from the Mile Gully High School. And other individuals here who have come here to give me their support. Today, Mr. Speaker, I want to use this intervention to provide this honorable house with our assessment of the transport sector. Our assessment of the transport sector. Since my last presentation a year ago, and to share some of our ideas of modernizing the entire transport grid to offer better quality of service to the people of Jamaica. In this presentation, also, Mr. Speaker, I have inquiries on the operations of the Jamaican Urban Transit Company, JUTC, and the overall management and movement of public passenger transport in the Kingston metropolitan region, transport region. There are some serious issues on which we have made no public comments because investigations are taking place by the Office of the Contractor General. He should be able to conduct his investigations without the concerns of political innuendo from any side. But there will come a time 
when our voices will be heard in some of these matters because the level of mismanagement, cronyism, and outright political interference in the functioning of some of these institutions simply cannot continue. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Mr. Speaker, I, do know if the new, I don't know if the new minister is now fully up to speed on all of the critical matters in his portfolio. But hopefully, if he pays attention, he would learn something here today that we can agree on. To move forward to make transportation better for the community, commuting public. In any event, Mr. Speaker, I would like to wish the new minister well in this portfolio. The wish is for him to be legendary, not for longevity. Mr. Speaker, we continue to believe that the transport sector can do better. A lot more can be done to bring better coordination and efficiency to the sector and improve the overall transportation environment for the traveling public and for the investors, both private and public. Over time, we have cultivated a system which is now fast resembling the chaotic system of the past and which we all agree should never return. We have, the stable, we have the subsidized government system operated mainly by the JUTC, which in turn gives franchises license to small operators to operate on specific routes in a support role. But this is not happening. There's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and everyone is fighting for their share of the transport dollar. The root taxi system designed to make available additional seats for the commuting public is not working well. This madness and chaos that have resurfaced in the system today is a result of the lack of enforcement of regulation, inadequate investment, misguided policies, and mismanagement. And if nothing else, it signals the need for for new and modern legislation to guide the process of development, improve service levels, pricing, and investment policy. The transportation sector, Mr. Speaker, is not just about road infrastructure, cars, rails, boats, and planes. It is not just about transport depots, airports, and seaports. It is also about the coordinated movement of people, moving people from the hills of St. Andrew to the plains of downtown Kingston efficiently, in comfort, safety, with dignity. The public can be assured of our shared goal and determination to add value to the public passenger transport system in Jamaica, from the rural parts to the urban centers. Mr. Speaker, I want to repeat for those who have ears to hear that our record in the area of public transportation is well established. This year, 2018, marks an important milestone in the, his milestone in the history of the Jamaica Urban Transit Company as the company celebrates its 20th anniversary. The JUTC was, an, was granted an exclusive license on September 7th, 1998, to provide 25,000 seats daily within the KMTR. Recently, as <clears throat> estimates of seating demand by the Transport Authority indicated that the seating demand is now 31,000 seats per day. The JUTC has been suffering losses over the years due to organizational and financial weaknesses, the uneconomic fears and inadequate government investment over the years have only worsened the perilous state of affairs at that company. Today, the most significant operational challenge being faced by the company is the proliferation of unlicensed taxis and bus 
operator, operators who operate without license or contrary to their license, to, to license granted by the Transport Authority on the JUTC main corridors. Consequently, Mr. Speaker, the JUTC's annual ridership has fallen from a high of 96.4 million in 2001-2002 to an extreme low of 49 million in 2008-2009 recovered to just over 60 million in the last PNP administration, but is now declining again. And last year was just under 50 million. During our administration, the government demonstrated its commitment to making the company best in class by utilizing technology and a newer fleet to improve the operations of the company, as well as introducing technology, innovations, partnerships with other government agencies and private sector to enhance the service. In reviewing the budget assumptions of 2018-19, it is clear that the government needs to undertake a major review of the mandate and operations of the JUTC. During this financial year, the projections is that the JUTC will operate a high of 425 buses per day and an average of 416 buses per day, which is lower than the peak in 2015-16, where the company maintained an average of 423 buses per day. This seems to be a pipe dream. However, Mr. Speaker, as of February of this year, the operation has fallen to 388 buses. And based on the approved budget, the target, targets are unlikely, as there is neither plan to inject any new buses in the operation of an, or an approved capital budget to refurbish any buses. At that level, Mr. Speaker, the company is in default as it is operating in breach of the exclusive license granted by the government under the past Public Passenger Transport Corporate Area Act. A number of questions must be immediately answered by the minister, as I am confident that the extent of some of these breaches will attract the attention of the Auditor General as it did, as it did during the previous GLP administration. Number one. How does the company plan to achieve the bus runout targeted in the 2018-19 budget? Number two, is the engineering department equipped to manage the maintenance of these buses? Number three, is there any plan to outsource the maintenance of buses? Four, if so, can the government provide the justification for this decision? Number five, what is the mechanic to bus ratio currently at the JUTC? Six, is the issue with the timely delivery of parts resolved? Number seven, with a report parts inventory of $900 million, why isn't there enough spare parts to adequately maintain the buses? Why? Number eight, is there a plan to outsource accident investigation and what is the cost? Number nine, why is it necessary to be buying tires from private companies when the JUTC owns the Jamaica Ultimate Tire Company? With its present course of action, JUTC is expecting to increase the fair income in 2018-19 by some 221 million, or 5% over 2017-18. With all the data available to us, this is an unrealistic expectation at the present operating levels. Additionally, in comparing the unaudited, unaudited financials for 
it's evident that the company is not on a growth path. The projected fair income for 2017-18 is expected to decrease marginally below 2016-17 with an average of nine more buses and the inclusion of the revenues earned from the Maypen Rural Bus Service. The question, therefore, will commuters be faced with an increase in bus fares during this fiscal year? Last week, the minister indicated his, his desire to discuss the state of affairs at both the JUTC and the Montego Bay Metro Company. Mr. Speaker, I am ready and my team and I await a date and time convenient to him. Mr. Speaker, I want to raise the important issue of the Portmore Transport Hub project. The Ministry of Transport and Mining's budget for 2018-19 does not include a provision for the Portmore project. The Portmore Hub is a critical investment in, in providing an efficient transport service for the ever-expanding Portmore communities which is a dormitory municipality. This would reduce some expenses that both JUTC and Portmore residents incur, incur day after day, such as a toll which this year will cost the company over $400 million. Toll, a loan for the JUTC for this fiscal year is budgeted at over $400 million. The optimal daily requirement of buses to serve Portmore residents is 150, yet the maximum number of buses projected to run out from the Portmore depot in the JUTC's 2018-19 projection is only 123. And may I note, Mr. Speaker, that on days there are under 100 buses running out of the Portmore municipality. The Portmore residents are once again being punished with substandard operations, and there are no future plans to alleviate this distress. If there are no plans to continue investing in the project, the minister must indicate to taxpayers what will become of the millions spent on preliminary costs, such as designs and soil tests, the national outcome number nine of Vision 2030 plan speaks specifically to creating strong economic infrastructure in reference to the development of modernized public transport system and a multimodal regional logistic hub will be priorities as they still, are they still priorities of this government? <clears throat> uh, victimization, I would say, or, or just no care. The establishment of the Portmore Hub would assist to fulfill, would assist to fulfill the Vision 2030 objectives and more directly the operations of the JUTC by allowing the buses to cycle on a more efficient basis and provide, by allowing, provide a higher level of service. The Portmore Hub facility was expected to provide improved passenger comfort by, by allowing connections to Halfway Tree, Downtown, and Spanish Town, all in one location, and at the same time, reduce the fuel consumption, toll costs, and infuriating traffic jam on the roadways, especially in the peak periods. The projections for fuel and toll costs for the JUTC in 2018-19 are $3.68 billion on fuel and $42 million, respectively, on toll, and $420 million on toll, respectively. The Portmore Depot accounts for 97% of to all toll charges. The government must say if it will continue bleeding taxpayers' money with the high toll charges that inevitably increase annually, or will they establish the transport hub in an effort to effect Vision 2030? 
Mr. Speaker, there was a report, an article done by Mr. Dennis Chung, which argues about the, the argument is that the, lo the lost productivity from traffic congestion is not focused enough on as an economic development strategy. In any developed country that you go to public transportation and the, me and the mass movement of people is central to development. A central strategy on using transportation as an integral part of development is to invest properly in the JUTC public transport system, control and proper traffic management. Mr. Speaker, there has been blatant political interference in the company's operations over the, past, over the past last two years, which has resulted in low staff morale and high attrition rate. The wanton firing of long-serving professionals and replacement by political hand-picked persons is weakening the company and its ability to effectively serve the people of Jamaica. Some locations which were usually managed by one manager now has two persons providing oversight as a reward for political allegiance. As a result of this, some of the most valued employees have left the company for employment elsewhere. The JUTC is now faced with the declining revenue and buses. And the time has now come for a major assessment to guide the future of the company. The overall assessment must include its general mandate, service levels in the KMTR, and investment needed by the government to ensure, ensure the company achieves its mandate. Mr. Speaker, I move on to the matter of works. No? You want me to finish? Yeah. Uh, that finish. Mr. Speaker, I, um, I, I, I wish that the Prime Minister was here. I wish that the Prime Minister was here. Mr. Speaker, let me state as we have before. Because today we have received invitations to the opening, renaming of the North South Highway. And Mr. Speaker, as the opposi opposition have stated before, that we have no issue of the highway being named. But we think that it is disingenuous of the government to want to name the highway at this current time after the former Prime Minister, Edward Siaga. And why so, why, why that objection? Why that objection, Mr. Speaker? Is that it is a slap in the face. Minion, quiet of decency, thank you, that we have a, the, the, the former Prime Minister, Portia Simpson Miller, who started the project, who concluded the project, and is still alive and well with us, that the Prime Minister would see it fit not to give the honor to the former Prime Minister, Portia Simpson Miller, but to name it after former Prime Minister Edward Siaga, who, may I remind you, Mr. Speaker, opposed and objected to the development of the Highway, highway 2000. And the opposition, Mr. Speaker, again states its objection to this renaming of the North-South Highway. 
Mr. Speaker, I turn, to, turn now to the, work, to, to the works portfolio. But as I indicated earlier, my remarks will be brief because my colleague member of parliament from Clarendon Northwest, Mr. Richard Azan, will present an assessment and comments on the state of our roads and bridge, bridges and bridge infrastructure and the lack of and the lack of commitment from the government to give a proper schedule of maintenance and projects to improve the sector. Outside, what has already been committed under the mid-P, which was a which was a carried over program from the previous PMP administration. It appears to us that the major infrastructure development pro project is now coming to an end. And there is no indication that the program will be continued in the same fashion. The major road works taking place across the country represents approximately 85% of the capital expenditure of the, of, for this financial year. Mr. Speaker, the question, therefore, what is the government planning to do in relation to the maintenance of, of the roads and bridges? For now, I will only ask these questions. Is there a plan to enter into a new financial arrangement with the People's Republic of China to finance another round of major infrastructure projects, which would include some levels of road maintenance and construction of new bridges? If the answer is no, well, can the government tell the House and the people of Jamaica, what is the, effort, is the short to medium term plan to deal with the road maintenance and the increasing number of broken bridges, potholes, and dilapidated structure? Routine maintenance of, the, the routine maintenance of the road infrastructure is suffering severely. When you look at the overall picture, it would appear that some parts of the country are totally forgotten. The only time these parts are remembered is when the CDF, the Constituency Development Fund, can manage to incorporate remedial and temporary works. We have talked about this maintenance issue before, and we have concluded that it is a good thing if it is routine and continuous and not the ad hoc manner which now prevails. In summary, Mr. Speaker, there is need for a comprehensive routine maintenance program to deal, to deal with these, those roads which have not yet been touched in previous expenditures. Mr. Speaker, we also have to find ways to apply the balance, regular routine to the debushing effort across the affairs of our island, not just once a year, but routinely. For example, Maintenance of the North Coast Highway is done with some degree of irregularity and the roads are in good condition. We need a similar application to the remainder of our roads. It is worth reminding the House also that June 1 is the start of the 2018 hurricane season. June 1 has not yet arrived, but the first hurricane of the season has already moved through parts of our hemisphere. Others will come and will take different paths. But we have seen the destruction that they are capable of unleashing. Mr. Speaker, we have no control over these seasonal weather systems. But the best preparation is to keep our roads, drains, and gullies clean. Mr. Speaker, we are coming, Mr. Speaker. The, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the member's time be extended by 15 minutes to enable him to complete his presentation. But you know, Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I would enjoy the presentation by members on that side. If only I could see them. This blaring light <laughs> blind the view from over here. I don't know why it is necessary. 
uh, and Mr. Samuda, an observation was made sometime last week by the deputy in relation to the lights. Yes. Mr. Speaker made no such request for lights. These lights normally turn on when we have presentation and normally with, um, turn on the person, you know, reflect the person speaking. But we have noticed that over the past weeks only this one is turned on. The me member is speaking. And the purpose of television, there is no light on him. And that's the purpose of it. Okay? So I never asked for it. It normally turns toward the person speaking for the purpose of, of the television. But what the house leader is saying that this is blinding because only this one has been turned on weeks after weeks, weeks after weeks. <laughs> Just listen to me. The, the motion is that the member's time be extended by 15 minutes to allow him to complete his presentation. Those in favor? Those against? I serve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members. Mr. Speaker, others will come and, uh, and will take different paths, but we have seen the destruction that they are capable of unleashing. Mr. Speaker, we have no control over these seasonal weather systems, but the best preparation is to keep our roads, gullies, drains clean. Yeah? In recent months, we have experienced unusual weather and flooding in several areas of the country. Yet, we have not seen a requisite investment to remedial works in our communities to protect us from the destruction of these off-season torrents. The fact is, the government does not see routine maintenance as a priority. We will just continue to hope that we are spared, spared time and time again. In the 2016-17 financial year, MPs were not engaged in any flood mitigation program. The NWA claimed to have done a one-off in-house program, which turned out to have been very inadequate. There were small programs at the start of 2017 hurricane season and in December of 2017. All of these were inadequate. Every time it rains heavily in some parts, communities are flooded, properties lost, and the workflow and, and the workflow and people's lives interrupted. We can't afford that kind of approach any longer. Mr. Speaker, the time is now for a comprehensive disaster mitigation program to save the billions lost in infrastructure, agriculture, and housing damage every year. Mr. Speaker, I have a thought on the Learn, Earn, Give, and Save Legs program, which is a part of the whole program being done in collaboration with the Jamaica Defense Force. The LEGS program focus, aims its focus on the training of unattached youths. It is in some way similar to the Lift Up Jamaica program, and therefore with some tweaking of training approach, some tweaking in training approach, and with the guidance and of the expertise of the engineering regiment of the JDF, these young people could be trained and brought on to assist in this routine maintenance program. You can train them in steel work, you can train them in welding, you can train them in carpentry. The government should use the hundreds of young people being registered in the program with the JDF to maintain, upgrade, and build out some of, of our infrastructure. Also, involvement of some of communities. At the same time, have hearts could be used to do job certification, this would not only benefit the youth, but also the entire country. Mr. Speaker, the acronym HOPE, Housing Opportunity, Production and Employment is now without the housing component. 
Mr. Speaker, if there is still one, we on this side would like to know about it. In 2016, Hope replaced the Jeep program, which had a housing component and which had allowed small contractors to be employed to do infrastructure work in all 63 constituencies. This honorable house will recall that in 2016, I made certain remarks relating to the quality of the houses under the Jeep program. In, the, in his haste to repudiate my comments, the Prime Minister accused me of jeopardizing the program. However, he publicly committed his support for the housing component of the Jeep Hope program in collaboration with Food for the Poor. Well, Mr. Speaker, the last set of houses under this program was built in the 2016-17 financial year. Nothing has, nothing has come of the Prime Minister's commitment in this program. So I would like to know if the commitment still stands. There are people in my constituency who heard them, who heard him then, and are wondering. What is the Prime Minister doing about this housing program for the poor people? We have been asking the Prime Minister if this program will be renewed as he promised. And up to now, like so many other things, there is deafening silence. I would ask the question of the Prime Minister again, but we believe that the answer can be found in the 2018-19 budget. The housing program is now dead and the needy potential beneficiaries must walk away feeling hopeless like hope. Mr. Speaker, we are certainly happy to see the efforts being made by the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority in the aftermath of the lightning strike, which damaged equipment and closed our airspace for days. We are delighted that real efforts are being made now to upgrade the system and improve capacity. Plus, doing some common sense thing that should give us greater efficiency in that sector. Jamaica Air safety record is one we can all boast about and should never be compromised. Jamaica's record stands above the world's average in terms of effective implementation of standards set out by the International Civil Aviation Organization. And we must do, every, do everything to protect it. With this in mind, I am concerned that in the past 18 months, we have had two accidents involving small aircraft resulting in the loss of lives. There was one in November 2016 in Kingston and another in May 2018 in Trelawney. We, we have not yet heard anything of the report of the investigation of the accident in November of 2016, which involved two students and their instructor. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us when will the report, be give, report given on accident be ready and made available to the public? Secondly, he should advise whether he sh it is a legal requirement. Thank you, former minister. Secondly, he should advise whether the investigation on the crash in May of this year has commenced and can he indicate a timeline on the completion and publication. Mr. Speaker, we also wish to be updated on the divestment of Norma Manley International Airport. We know that, the, know that the deadline has been extended three times and the country should be told if the process is in trouble or is it just taking more time than anticipated. The truth is than anticipated. We are not novices at airport divestment, Mr. Speaker as the Sangster International Airport in Montego Bay is now celebrating 15 years since divestment. We congratulate them on this milestone. This side support the airport divestment strategy, but enterprise team needs to update the country through the minister on the issues surrounding 
the divestment of NMIA. So, Mr. Speaker, in closing, I remind, in closing, I remind the government that good infrastructure is key to the prosperity of a country and the quality of life experience of its people. We have come a far way and the mid PE has greatly assisted. It was the foresight of the former Prime Minister and her Minister of Finance and Minister of Transport and Work, Works to have executed a vision that now allow us, allows us to see the expansion of much of the critical corridors in the capital city and leading into Kingston from central and western parishes. We cannot afford to stop working because Ms. Mid P is coming to an end or because the government refuses to resolve the funding. We have to continue the transformation by creating new vision to take us to even greater levels of development for our country. There is no need to take credit for what you did not dream or, or do. Dream now, Mr. Prime Minister, and do not stop dreaming. Jamaica will benefit. It is a famous American who said, you would be surprised at what you can achieve when you don't care who gets the credit. The previous administration did just that. And finally, I want to make an appeal to drivers. I would like to make an appeal to drivers on the road. Exercise caution and, allow, and, and follow the road code. Too many of our citizens are losing their lives on our roads. People are being killed and maimed carelessly. Drivers, especially public passenger vehicles, must exercise better care and exhibit better driving habits. The life you save just could be your own. Those who have ears, let them hear. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Mr. Speaker, our final presenter for the day will be the Member of Parliament from Southern Manchester. I ask that you invite him to make his presentation. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Speaker, I seek your permission to speak from a seat other than my own. You may go ahead, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is an honor to rise in this esteemed house to make a contribution in the sectoral debate on the education sector in Jamaica. First, I want to thank God for his blessing and divine guidance. As today marks two years, three months, three days, since I became a member of this legislature. Let me also thank my wife and family for the tremendous support they have given me during this time. The members of my constituent executive, my staff at the office, my two councillors, councillors Anthony Bryce and Councillor Dalton Brown, 
and the teams that have been giving support in the other two divisions. The citizens of South Manchester who are, tuned, who are tuning now and are watching it, this presentation live. My church family and friends, I say thanks. You are the reason why I'm here. I want to thank Dr. Peter Phillips, the leader of the position, and our distinguished party leader for his guidance and support. To all my colleagues, I say a big thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would like first to offer sincere condolences to the family of young Allen and the Bogwok High School family for the murder of that young man recently. My sympathies to the family of the Queens High School student who was stabbed recently, and I pray God for her speedy recovery. Mr. Speaker, it is often said that the school is a microcosm of the wider society, and the rampant indiscipline, the lack of regard for life is now impacting a number of our schools across the country. Mr. Speaker, any realization of inclusive growth can only be achieved by a labor force that is educated and trained for both economic modernization as well as improved social behavior. Despite tremendous progress, our education system perpetuates the class, color, and economic disparities and prejudices in the, our country. This has limited social mobility and development of social capital, two key components to a socially cohesive and productive society. Mr. Speaker, education has always been viewed by us on this side as a main mechanism for creating a more just and equitable society. It was Sir Arthur Lewis, a renowned Caribbean economist, who postulated years ago, and here I quote, the fundamental cure for poverty is not money, but education, end of quote. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, today we are seeing where many of our students and young adults believe that the fundamental cure for poverty is money derived through ill-gotten gain, whether it is scamming, trading in contraband, or robbing purses of their hard-earned cash, and even committing murder. Mr. Speaker, I dare say that many of these things are happening because, as a country, we have lost our social, spiritual, and moral compass. Our education system, which should be that guiding light, has failed many of our students in many instances. The family structure is weak, thereby compounding the problem. Mr. Speaker, I dare say that our education system needs a new birth, a renaissance, if our society is to be rescued. Mr. Speaker, education must result in purifying one's perception. It has to develop and coordinate moral and spiritual urges and ensure good character while discriminating between good and bad. The educated person must apply the criterion of service to humanity. Unfortunately, there are some persons who support an education system which has as its aim the earning of wealth, attaining a comfortable life of leisure and pleasure at the expense of others. Mr. Speaker, that perception must change if our society is to move forward. The boorish behavior, whether in the schools, the home, on the streets, and I dare say sometimes here in Parliament, is not advanced in our 23rd division. The late Professor Rex Nettleford once said, and I quote, a butu in a bend is still a butu, and it must be part of our responsibility to change that mentality. Mr. Speaker, some two decades ago, former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable P.J. Patterson, launched the Values and Attitudes program. This program was aborted by many naysayers who did not support the program. Today, we are reaping the whirlwind. Mr. Speaker, my mentor and colleague, Oliver Ronald, tweets, myself, we have attended several meetings with the minister and his team as it relates to launching the Values and Attitudes program. 
And what has been their sticking point? To find out whether or not the program should be named to recall a values and attitudes program. I say, Mr. Speaker, while Nero Fiddle, Rome burns, and we need to get back on track. Mr. Speaker, we on this side are called upon our Minister of Education to relaunch the Values and Attitudes program. This program must commence in the basic schools, the infant schools and the high schools across the country. We can no longer wait for this program to commence stream, as too many of our schools are turning out students who lack the core transformational values, values such as honesty, truthfulness, respect, trust, forgiveness, tolerance, national pride, love, and good work ethic, to name a few. Jamaica is on the cups of our 23rd vision, and a sound education encompassing these basic tenets is critical to our development. Mr. Speaker, I know of several schools across the country where teachers fear going to school on a Monday morning. Many of them experience psychological disorders as they think about the poor behavior, the lack of respect, and the lack of interest in learning by some students that they will face. Mr. Speaker, there are currently 176, there are currently 761 public primary schools in the country, which are regarded as feeder schools for the 171 high schools across the country. Of course, we hear the phrase that there is a place for every child at every high school. And the more than 40,000 students who sit the GSAT each year get into the high school system. However, data show that at the end of the five years of high school education, there is one level of performance at traditional high schools and another level for the so-called so non-traditional high schools, resulting in only 14% of the students and non-traditional high schools passing five subjects or more to include math and English at the CSEC level. Mr. Speaker, it is our intention on this side to double the per capita allocation for those schools consistently falling below the national outcome target. That is five CXCs or equivalent competence, competences, including English, mathematics, and digital technology. More emphasis must be placed on these non-traditional high schools in order to bring them to the required standard. These non-traditional high schools are caught up in a vicious cycle, referred to as doc, by Dr. Peter Phillips as the apartheid system of education. We must change if our country is to move forward. Mr. Speaker, many of our parents and children undergo tremendous stress each year as they prepare for the transitional examination. And when the results are released, parents do everything in their power to ensure their, their children get into one of the name brand schools. My question to this honorable house is, can all our schools become name brand schools? I say yes. But to do this, there must be the will. And here I say the government must increase the size of the education budget, remove all remaining schools of the shift system, remove blackboard partition in our primary schools, reduce the class size one teacher to 25 schools at the primary level, and one to 20 at the high school level implement and fast track a properly monitored values and attitudes program from basic school to high school. Provide the necessary laboratory equipment for all our high schools. Implement a system where all students must be a member of a social organization, where it is, whether it is a Boy Scout, the Girls Guide, the Cadet, the Brownies, to name a few. Ensure that a senior member of these groups and or a member of the JDF is assigned to these schools at least once per week to monitor these programs. Of course, not all of our schools will need this rigid approach, as we do have good students and settled schools in many parishes. Mr. Speaker, I believe that the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information should collaborate with the teachers' colleges and implement a program for specialist 
primary school teachers in mathematics, English, science, social studies, and aesthetics to support the national standards curriculum. Mr. Speaker, if the poor performance in the CSEC <coughs> examination is to be corrected, consideration must be given to training these specialist teachers at the primary level, and this should be treated with urgency. Mr. Speaker, the ministry must revisit the training program offered in the teachers' colleges and ensure that teachers in training have a good grasp of what class control is all about, in addition to pedagogy. The Ministry of Education, Youth and Information must consult with the teachers' colleges and revisit the teaching practice period, which is now four months, and extend it to one year, as it was in previous years. Many of us are teachers here. When we did our TP, we had one year. Extensive preparation in the classroom. I believe we need to get back to those days. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, we must ensure that all of our students of school age are in school. And so the ministry must employ truancy officers yeah to visit the homes and the plazas where students usually hang out. Parents and guardians must ensure that their children are in school Monday to Friday. Where this is not happening, sanctions must be brought to bear on them. Of course, the state must provide the necessary resources. A reliable transportation system for rural schools must be put in place. Mr. Speaker, nutrition is key to the performance of our students. Studies have shown that approximately, and I heard the Minister of State saying 40% of the students who attend our schools lack proper nutritional support. The nutritional program for all schools must be looked at seriously. As currently 50% of the students are on PATH program, there are still some students who are only able to afford lunch two or three times per week despite the minister's pronouncement that every child will be provided with lunch five days per week. Mr. Speaker, this is not happening. Promise made about breakfast program is not happening. And where it is happening, there is no consistency in the program. The small subsidy granted to schools, especially where the canteens are run by concessionaires, where the cost for a lunch is higher, makes it unaffordable for some students. This must change. The Minister of Labor and the Minister of Education must work collaboratively to ensure that parents and children are not removed from the PATH program before proper and full investigations are carried out. Mr. Speaker, the social conditions of some households have improved, but they still fall below the poverty line and need help. When they are removed from the program, it impacts the education system negatively. Sure. Mr. Speaker, last year the Honourable Minister of Education spoke in a State of the Nation debate about the alternate pathway as a new approach to secondary education. This approach would have seen some 83 schools on the program. Mr. Speaker, this program, which has good intention, does not seem to have the teacher's interest at heart, as many of these teachers who were previously tenured and opted to work in the program have lost several benefits which they would have had if they had, were the regular classroom teachers. I'm therefore requesting that the employment conditions of these teachers be looked at seriously. Mr. Speaker, as we approach the end of the 2017-2018 school year, there are many parents and students who are nervous about the transition from the GSAT to the primary exit profile, PEP. And this week, we have seen a number of articles in several of our dailies, principals and parents speaking about the lack of clarity as the exams are concerned. The minister must ramp up the education program on the PEP tenfold or postpone this examination, which will come in stream next year. While I believe that our society is generally resistant to change, our parents and guardians do not want to gamble with their children's future. Every parent wants to ensure that his or her child gets into a name brand school. And so it is absolutely imperative
that the principals, the teachers, the students, the parents, guardians, and indeed the entire society have a clear understanding of what the curriculum-based test entails. They need to know what the ability test will be based on. They need to know what the performance test will entail. There is a lot of uncertainty and a lack of clear understanding as it relates to the primary exit profile PEP. Mr. Speaker, Jamaica needs more information on the primary exit profile, which will replace the GSAT during the next school year. And I call on the minister to give some clarity as it relates to this examination. Mr. Speaker, there are currently too many of our schools where there is uncertainty regarding the appointment of principals. One school I visited yesterday has an acting principal and an acting vice principal for over six years now. There are several other cases where persons have been acting in clear vacancies for over two years. This does not augur well for stability and effective management of the education system. There is also another worrying situation, and I ask the Minister of State to take note of this one, where some principals and school boards are at loggerheads for more than a year now. These incidents are happening across the country in a number of our schools. The Minister of Education should move with alacrity to have these untenable situations resolved. Mr. Speaker, despite the Minister's pronouncements that students at the high school level should not be prevented from attending school because of non-payment of fees, there are several students who are being threatened that they will not be able to sit the examination unless school fees or parents' contributions are paid. We ask that the ministry really send some direction to these schools that are preventing these students from participating in the education process. In some cases, these students are not being allowed to participate in their school living exercise because fees are still outstanding. Of course, this puts MPs under tremendous pressure as parents come seeking assistance each year. We on this side are called upon the Honorable Minister to address the situation as no child should be left behind if their parents can't afford resources to pay. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to tertiary education. The Minister of Education has stated that there is a national imperative to increase the percentage of eligible cohort holding a minimum of bachelor's degree from 15% to 80% by 2025. While this is a very ambitious move, we on this side would like to see the measures for funding higher education be given more than lip service. We know the hue and cry each year as students at the university level prepare to sit their examination. Last year we had it. This year again, we need to have students being settled as we prepare for the examination. We on this I believe that by adjusting the BOJ reserves and providing a measure of loan guarantee by the state, commercial financial institutions should provide the bulk of student loans. Mr. Speaker, all tertiary students who are aided directly and indirectly by the state by state funds should be bonded for a period of service in Jamaica for at least three years. We know the ministers announced policy on financing of tertiary education over the weekend, and we anticipate the full policy document in order to get more clarity. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of State, Honorable Floyd Green, in his sectoral presentation, stated that the hard trust will now fall under the auspices of the Minister of Economic Growth and Job Creation. And while we, while he did not give a timeline, we believe that this is a wrong move. You are going into a wrong jungle, Minister. As the hard trust should remain with education and training, it should also be the priority of the hard trust NTA in partnership with employers to reduce by at least a half within five years the high numbers of Jamaican, Jamaican workers 
without occupational certification. It is estimated that 70% of the Jamaican workforce is uncertified. The global education system now requires that higher education be an integrated system, one which incorporates formal, academic, technical, vocational, and professional education and training. And Jamaica must not be left behind, Mr. Speaker. However, greater care must, should be observed in granting appropriate accreditation to tertiary courses so as not to compromise quality. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the enormous contribution of education to the, to the education system by churches and trust must be respected, yes. celebrated, and enhanced. Their specific role in inculcating virtuous values and attitudes should be revived and not threatened. And we are feeling a little bit nervous where these church schools are concerned and so the pronouncements that are being made. And we say to the minister, don't go that route. Don't go that route. Mr. Speaker, there can be no more tinkering with education especially as we move closer to the 2030 National Development Plan. Mr. Speaker, in closing, I would like to remind every single person that education is everybody's business. Yes, yes. Education for the 21st century will only be realized by, the nas by a national crusade that optimizes the contribution of the church, the private sector, the community, yes. parents, yes. teachers, yes. state agencies, yes. alumni association, and the diaspora. Mr. Speaker, we on this side of the House are forever committed to this transformational process. We must seek to create an education system that supports the transformation in a society where that truly provides equal opportunity for all. May God bless Jamaica, land we love. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Well done. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, it is, it is not intended to do any further business today, so I ask you to adjourn this Honorable House until tomorrow, the 30th, at 2 p.m. Windsor, right? The motion is that the house be now adjourned until tomorrow, Wednesday the 30th at 2 p.m. Those in favor? Aye. Those against? As our, this honorable house now stands adjourned.